Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Matthew, and this is from chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12, the reading for, for Epiphany Sunday. Hear now then the word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means you are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me so that I may go and honor him too. And when they heard the king, they went, and look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, And falling to their knees, they honored him. And then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. And this ends the reading of scripture. May God bless us with understanding upon hearing God's word. Amen. Arise and shine. Those were the words that my mother used to wake us up in the morning. Arise and shine. Then she would sometimes follow that with, let me see the whites of your eyes. And all the time, this arise, shine thing came from Isaiah. The scripture that Gary wrote. It didn't actually start with my mother. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. What words? Arise, shine, light, glory, happy new year. Arise, shine, light, and glory. Let's let's look at those words just for a second. Let's look at the last two first. Let's look at the last two, uh, light and glory. We all want light in our lives. Every time that sun comes out in January, it seems pretty good. We like light, especially in the dark days of winter. Six days ago, I think it was something around nine hours and 20 minutes of daylight or something like that. Good news is the days are getting longer. By the end of the month, we'll probably we'll have something around 10 hours of light. In the wintertime, sometimes people are more apt to be depressed because of the lack of what? Light. Light, it's a good thing. We like it. But what about glory? What in the world is glory? The prophet Isaiah says... The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Well, we want glory too. It's just not as clear as daylight. So just exactly what is glory? And where do we find it? Glory has been described as majestic beauty and splendor, such as the glory of those stars that you might look up at on that cold winter's night, 
if it ever really gets really that cold. But well, on the cold winter's night, it seems that for some reason those stars are often clearer than ever. And we can see their glory. We say that we give someone glory when they produce some gorgeous piece of work of art. We sometimes experience glory as a bright and powerful light, like when the, the shepherds, what did they do? They were living in the fields around Bethlehem, and it says, And an angel of the Lord stood before them, and what? The glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were scared. But perhaps the simplest and clearest definition that I've come across of glory is uh, one that was offered by writer Frederick Buechner. And this is what he said. Glory is God's style. God's style. We all have style. You have a style. Glory is God's style. Glory is saying that the heavens are revealing God's style. The beauty of the sunset. The starry night. Even the thunderstorm that you see in the distance. Or the rainforest. The human face. It is God's style. unmistakably the work of God's style. That's glory. And God's style was revealed when some wise men made their visit to a baby named Jesus. And they give Jesus glory, and he is the child who grows up to show what? God's style. God's style in everything he says and does. God's style, the joy, the hope, the peace, the love. That's God's style. And so epiphany. Epiphany is all about that glory of God being revealed to the world. God's style showing up. But what effect does that glory have on us? Light and beauty, and splendor, and style. They really don't mean much unless they have some kind of an effect on our lives. Actually, there has been research done about glory. Did you know? I mean, scientific research, believe it or not. And, and, and part of this research has, has shown that glory is actually good for you. And here's the example. Say you're a fan of a sports team any sports team you might have in mind. Um, but uh, that can have actually very positive effects on you. According to the Atlantic magazine back in April, they were going through this, what was a landmark 1976 study that described these sports fans and the tendency to embrace a winning team as, this is the words that were used, basking in reflected glory. The key to having an experience of glory. And these studies reveal that being this fan of a sports team can actually do some, it can ward off depression if they're winning. It can ward off depression and, and feelings of alienation. When you're rooting for that home team, it can build this sense of belonging and self-worth so that good things come from basking in reflected glory. Isaiah, that Gary read. Isaiah was writing to people, to God's people, in a time when it was really dark. It was a time of deep darkness, one that was even gloomier than a bad January night. And what he promised was this. He promised that although this thick darkness was covering the people, something good was about to happen. 
even though it looked impossible. Something wonderful was about to take place. Here's what Isaiah said. He said, the Lord will arise upon you and the glory will appear over you. Israel's situation was tough. Let's, let's use the baseball example. It was, it was like the, the home team, and it's, it's down three runs. It's the bottom of the ninth. Bases are loaded. Two outs. Two strikes on the batter. It's the pitcher that's up. That doesn't tell you it's not good. But God tells Israel, look for the walk-off. Look for the home run. Glory. Now, we know that God did not enter human life as a home run hitter. God appears as what is a vulnerable baby with a mom, with a dad, and they are on the run from this evil King Herod guy. And Isaiah sensed how God was going to come to earth, which is why he said, Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We read about what happens on that first epiphany? But what happens to us when we experience this glory? What happens is this, is that we discover that Jesus is indeed the light of the world. And that as the light of the world, as Jesus drives away the isolation, the despair, the unrest, and gives us instead the gift of forgiveness and gives us the gift of this relational connection that has been broken and given us the gift of eternal life and guess what even changes our attitudes. And our attitudes toward the world that's around us, our attitudes toward each other, and invites us into the reign of God. When we walk in this glory of the light of Christ, what we discover is that the goal of our lives is no longer to earn the most money or to win the most awards or to close the most deals, or to accumulate the most possessions. Instead, it is to be authentic women and men that God created us to be. The goal of our lives is to be full human beings, standing in the very presence of our loving God. Now let's go back to those other two words. Arise and shine. That, those words, are the, okay, now what? That's what that part of the message is. Now, what do we do with this? When we experience the light of God and are covered with the glory of God, Apparently, according to Isaiah, we cannot help but arise and shine. Let's, for example, turn to that sports team, and you're watching it with some friends. Maybe it's the Cardinals, maybe it's the Cubs. <laughs> and you have your sodas or whatever drink it is that you happen to have in your hands, and you have your popcorn in your lap. And we're back at that ninth inning. And there are those two strikes, those two outs, those bases loaded, your team is up. And suddenly, inexplicably, against all odds, on that final pitch, that pitcher batter hits a walk-off home run. And your team wins. Here is the question. 
At what point in the ninth inning did you arise and shine? At what point in that inning did you arise and shine? Because nobody, no true fan, could watch that without standing up, at least theoretically, and hollering, and probably the popcorn going everywhere. It's impossible. When the glory of the Lord is upon us, there's no way we're sitting on our hands. For the truth is, the popcorn is probably going to be flying all over the place. And we are going to be shouting from the housetops that God has come to us. That our salvation is here. So, whether it's my mother or Isaiah, arise and shine. For the light and the glory of God are upon us. Amen.